A warm welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, my name is Thomas Kleine Brockhoff. I'm the director of GMF's Berlin office. And I would like to thank you all for joining us for this month's Transatlantic Tuesday. Now, Transatlantic Tuesdays is a monthly event series devoted to discussing some of the more important, even most important, uh, transatlantic trends and issues uh, of the day with experts from both sides of the Atlantic. I would also like to thank our Business Alliance partners for making this event series possible. Now, talking about timing, today we want to be want to discuss Germany's role in the Russia uh, crisis uh, on the day that Chancellor Olaf Scholz is in Moscow to continue uh, the attempt to get a, to a diplomatic resolution of the crisis uh, that um, is on the Ukrainian-Russian border and in Moscow. Um, the press conference between the two is just over, so this seems like a bit of an impeccable timing here. Um, we will, since this is a very quick format of 45 minutes, we'll start with a brief moderated conversation for about 15-20 minutes. A um, couple of rounds of, uh, of questions. And then uh, there's questions that you may ask. Please uh, use the, uh, the Q&A uh, function, please, to do that at the bottom of your screen. Now, before beginning, I'd like to introduce our three uh, panelists. Nora Müller heads the International Affairs Department uh, in Berlin of the Körber Foundations, a Foundation, one of Germany's large private foundations. Corey Sharkey is a senior fellow and director of foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Hi, Corey. Uh, Eugenio Smolnar is a foreign policy analyst and board member of the Center for International Relations in Warsaw, he was a political prisoner in 1968 and 69, jailed for organizing pro-democracy protests and opposing the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact. I thought I would mention that as well. So let's get uh, started. And what I would like to do is uh, give uh, Nora Müller the, the last word of this first round to already collect a few impressions uh, of how Germany's handling of this crisis is being perceived. And I wanna start with a bit of a provocative question to, um, to Corey, there is intense criticism of Germany in, uh, in Washington in these past few weeks, at least in some quarters, uh, culminating in the headline by the Wall Street Germany, is Germany still a reliable ally? Nine, this morning on the website of the uh, European Council on Foreign Relations, Jeremy Shapiro uh, writes, and I'll have to quote this, so fresh off the printing press, uh, um, if judging by the tone of the conversation, one might imagine that it is Germany that is about to invade Ukraine rather than Russia. So is there a bit of a friend and foe problem in Washington? No, I don't think there's a friend and foe problem in Washington. I do think the German government has not been clear uh, not been clear as some other allies about uh, what would what the economic consequences, particularly in the energy markets, would be for Russia if they pull the trigger on their invasion of Ukraine. But I do also think that you know it's a new German government, it's a coalition government, it's finding its feet in the midst of a crisis. They haven't done half badly, but they do also deserve some criticism for the positions that they've taken. So what, I'm understand. sorry, one more thing I should say. Uh, okay. I saw some of the press conference uh, that just recently happened. And I have to say, it looks to me like the chancellor's finding his footing. He looked comfortable and confident and, uh, you know, trolling Vladimir Putin a little bit with, uh, 
with uh, comments about how long each of them might stay in power. Um, I thought it was a fine performance. So, so I think the direction is incredibly positive. And he also asked, he also mentioned with a little bit of irony that he didn't know how long President Putin would intend to stay in power. Um, um, okay, but um, Eugenia, um, German-Russian relations were at the low point before this crisis. Um, they've never been as bad. One could say that Nord Stream 2 was the lifeline of the relationship because there was very little else. Um, yet in Central Eastern Europe, um, that was the main critique, that there is a, a sort of a distrust that Germany might do the wrong thing or not do the right thing at least. Um, in the last few days, we've seen attempts at course correction. We've seen reassurance efforts. Uh, the president is in, in Latvia today. Uh, Lithuanian troop deployments have been increased. Uh, Chancellor in, in Kiev yesterday. So there is a shifting tone and there is attempts at reassurance. Help me understand from your region, the perception of Germany in this crisis. Well, I believe, and believe you me, I do not agree with the sovereignist policy of the present Polish government and often, uh, and, and often produced uh, propaganda onslaught on Germany. But we have, a, we have a problem. And it's not only a problem of Nord Stream 2, because from Warsaw's perspective, it's not just a problem of economy or a possible German-Russian cooperation. But actually, it was put on the table that uh, you can have all the gas from Russia you want if you build another second or third or fourth pipeline, land pipeline, going through Belarus and Poland. And Germany went along Russian argument, somehow agreeing that Poland, an ally within the European Union and NATO, is not to be trusted. This is the crew of, of the argument, because the explanation which came from Berlin, as you well remember, were going back and forth from economic to geopolitical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the crew of the matter. So the, 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 uh, the so kind of, uh, all the talk about uh, solidarity, support, also in the context of Ukraine, are a bit flimsy, hanging in the air. And also we have to see all the situation in the context of other facts and processes, not only, which I do not underestimate a traditional German diplomatic tradition of Ostpolitik and Talk, talk is better than, than, than war, war, which is unthinkable to the British public, to the German public and to the German government. I, I get it. It's, it's all there. But there were other facts, you know. Um, just, uh, I recall, Germany proclaims the value of European unity, fine. But on the other hand, it was Merkel and Macron proposal last June to talk directly to Putin uh, without any consultation with the Allies, without any uh, diplomatic preparedness, and it was rejected. Did it serve the purpose of unity of Europe, or it did not? I believe it did not. The coalition agreement of the new government includes a proposal for majority vo voting in the EU foreign and security policy. Who will agree to that in Central Eastern Europe as a result of this you know, uh, various uh, incidents. Germany enjoyed President Biden's withdrawal from the threat of, of, of uh, you know, to Nord Stream 2, but it took upon itself an obligation to secure supplies to Ukraine. Who is talking about it now? I mean, we have the several things, of course, the... Well, the, let, uh, me, let, me, let me interrupt you, Jen. So, so if you look at just not relitigating Nord Stream 2, but looking at these last current events. Is there any assessment from you? I know you have watched events even in the last hours as we have. Any first assessment from you on that? 
I think the new chancellor has behaved credibly and he is learning, but we, it is not a kindergarten. We are facing one of the biggest threats to, to the European security since 1989. Everyone agrees that. And uh, uh, it, it is a problem that uh, Germany is a linchpin of European integration. And I believe that because of various facts, statements like, for example, the naval head of the, you know, of the own naval forces. I, I wonder why, is it really important or was it eccentricity? No, it is important because it reveals a way how very important part of the German establishment talks about the issue. This is important. So, you know, you grab this crumbles this, this from here and there, and you try to, to, to think, to visualize what is the real thinking in the chancellery, in the Bundestag, the pressure from Austin Schulz, the, uh, uh, two days ago, there was a strong statement against any moves that would deteriorate economic relation between Germany and, and Russia. So, you know, you look at the picture and the picture is not very nice and not very bright. So Nora Müller, thank you, uh, Ginek. Um, um, what do you take from these first uh, two assessments? Are, we, are the critics missing something? The proponents of, of this current uh, German government um, say that the, uh, the, this government is doing more than meets the eye, uh, especially in this question. Um, um, or is, is it the other way around? Are we seeing a passive, a reluctant partner when you collect, uh, as has been said, the crumbles, there's all kinds of evidence um, that this is a, a public and a political class that hasn't understood uh, the moment, if I sort of sum up what, uh, what Genius has just uh, said. Well, Thomas, I, I, I kind of find myself um, very much agreeing with, with Corey here. I mean, what we have to bear in mind is that um, the new German government kind of had to hit the ground running in managing a major, if not the major security crisis after the end of the Cold War. Now, I'm definitely not here to, to sort of represent anyone and certainly not to defend the, the, the German government. But um, I will say that I think this needs to be borne in mind. Now, were mistakes made? Yes, certainly mistakes were made, um, uh, especially when it comes to communication. And I think it's, it's never a sign of great foreign policy success if you manage to alienate some of your closest um, allies. Um, but I, I will also say that, first of all, Berlin has proved um, and the new government has proved to be a, a learning system, as we can um, see by, by, by the, the today's visit to Moscow, for example, by, by Chancellor Scholz. And I believe that, you know, in spite of the, the differences that are there or were there, on issues such as Nord Stream 2 or this infamous howitzers issue. In essence, I think there is, um, there is an alignment, certainly between the US and Germany, but also between Germany and, and its, its European partners. So my problem, while I do see you know, that some of the criticism on, on Germany is justified, my problem with this discourse on, you know, oh, Germany is no longer a reliable ally and is on its way out when it comes to the political West and everything. My problem with that was that um, it, it kind of seemed to play into the hand of those um, who want to, to see the West divided. And I think Joe Biden understood that very well. And that's why he said um, when, when Olaf Scholz was in DC that Germany is, and here I'm, I'm quoting, is completely, totally, thoroughly reliable. And I think that's the message that, that needs to be hammered home. Okay, before I go into a little a second round of questions here, um, I want to encourage uh, those uh, viewing this um, to uh, use the Q&A functions 
a function and uh, pile up a list of, of, of questions that I can uh, start using because I want to go right into what you're interested in. So Corey, um, I want to go back to what uh, Jeremy Shapiro wrote this morning. And there's another quote from, from, uh, from him. And that is not his own quote, but sort of a summary of, the, of, the, of what he thinks there's a mood in the political class, especially on the Hill, more on the conservative side, but not limited to the conservative side by any means of the political spectrum. What he talks about is Germany's refusal to publicly confront the hard realities of geopolitics carries a cost and that Germany is seen as playing a double game of virtue signaling, climate change, and free riding on American security on the, on the, uh, on the other hand, and that there is sort of a, a sense that, that folks are giving up on this country's ability to be a major power in Europe and pull some of the weight that many in Washington had hoped it would play. If that is a debate that rings true to you or you can recognize elements of it, help us understand of what, that, what does that debate look in the context of the current, of the current crisis? I do think the debate is occurring and I think it's an important debate right? Burden sharing is a routine feature of alliances. It's not something, um, you know, just of this moment. Every American Secretary of Defense always wants European allies to do more than they're doing. And, and it's responsible to have that conversation um, about the fairness of our respective obligations to each other. Um, but I also think it's true that, um, that there is, it is more the case in Germany than even in other European countries um, to be somewhat sanctimonious about superior virtue uh, by always leaning towards multilateralism as the answer to any solution, to any problem at hand. Um, and very often that multilateralism uh, doesn't solve the problem. So, uh, but again, this isn't new. I seem to recall in 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait, there were German protests outside the American embassy uh, because of the anticipation that President George H.W. Bush uh, would had said, this will not stand. And German Chancellor Kohl uh, ruminating publicly whether Germans were also going to protest outside Iraq's embassy, since after all, it was Iraq that invaded Kuwait. Um, so, you know, I think we're all finding our way in this uncertain security environment. We want a Germany that's virtuous, that thinks carefully about issues of war and peace. And it's actually perfectly natural for there to be disagreements amongst allies about what to do and when to do it. What I think is the most important part of the glue that holds the transatlantic relationship together is that we allow ourselves to be persuaded, not just by the legitimacy of views that we don't share, but to navigate towards a common policy. And I think Germany and the United States have actually done that exceedingly well um, in the crisis that Russia has imposed on all of us over Ukraine. That's an important uh, closing point here, which is the crisis that Russia has imposed uh, on all of us. So Nora, when you, as you did, emphasize the unity element, what is it that you expect from this German government, uh, especially in a moment like this? What are next steps that you would envision after today? And then I want to get back to one other question, probably directed uh, directly at, at Eugenius. 
Well, thank you, Thomas. Well, I think going back again to the visit that we saw today to Moscow, um, I think Chancellor Scholz kind of managed this tightrope walk between um, diplomacy on the one hand and deterrence on the other hand. Um, and by the way, just in brackets, I want to say that um, sort of um, sending a strong signal for strengthening um, civil society in Russia was was also um, important, um, just in brackets. Um, but um, I, I would expect Berlin to continue along this path. That means, um, on the one hand, continuing to, to seeking and, and strengthening um, European and transatlantic unity when it comes to the current crisis, um, at the same time also um, at least helping to reassure our allies in, in Central and Eastern Europe, and at the same time trying to pursue and to kind of open the um, spaces for diplomacy that are there and um, the frameworks in which diplomacy could work are well known. Of course, there's the Normandy um, format. Um, there is also the NATO Russia Council for, for that matter. So I think um, these are the, the roles that Germany should play in, 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 the, in the current crisis. Eugenius, there is a couple of questions already on potential refugees. Um, and could Putin flood Europe with refugees? That means Ukrainian refugees. And what would happen? Well, it's a double sword question, because on one hand, they would be welcomed because of the gentrification of the European labor market. And they, like Poles in the West, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, France, uh, Scandinavia, they adapt very quickly. There are no cultural clashes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, it's going to be, it could be a short-term um, refugee crisis because uh, Poland or Visegrad countries are not prepared uh, for this kind of, of event. If if you would allow me, I would follow on what Nora has said. I get the division of labor. I get the Americans, Brits, even France, uh, with Macron being infuriated by the way how he's handled in Moscow, now talk about strengthening the deterrence. We don't hear this kind of voices from Berlin. Do we hear anything from Berlin about U European Union's participation in the negotiations with Moscow? We were talking about geopolitical European Union, didn't we? Where is it? We don't. So we have been witnessing a very complex, multi-layer diplomatic effort to persuade Russia not to invade a sovereign country, which, by the way, Putin calls it's not a state, it is a land. And uh, it takes time and it takes unity of signals of the, that the, there will be an unprecedented cost to Moscow. And I don't see this unity. I mean, public statements matter as much as what they say in the closed rooms. It also matters. But the public must be reassured that there is a unity of purpose and there is a diplomatic effort which is really being integrated with one another deterrence and open door policy, NATO open door policy, and talking to Russia. But can, do we have unity? On January the 13th, German, Germany's defense minister warned against dragging Nord Stream 2 into the conflict. On January 21st, foreign minister has downplayed the prospect of disconnecting Russia from Swiss. I mean, these are the facts which are part of the game. And I, I understand if they wouldn't be, ever be used, but the fact that this kind of statements, they couldn't keep quiet and let Putin and Lavrov to keep guessing. No, they had to go on record and say, it's, it's not on the table of the German government. The Germany may refrain from selling defensive armaments to Ukraine under the pretext of the ban of arms says to conflict region, but the Germany also prevented NATO agency to deliver some really 
limited amount of defensive weapons. So it would be as if it would be Ukraine that wages war on Russia and not the other way around. So um, also something which really struck me, I don't know whether you recall, uh, there was a destruction of a Russian battery by, by Ukrainian drone in October 2021, after several days of artillery shelling in Donbass, in which another Ukrainian soldier was killed. Germany's statement, by the way, French statement as well, but it was weaker than Germany's statement, called on both sides to show restraint, but mentioned only a drone attack and leaving out the action of Russia and, and the separatists. Maybe, this is all. Yeah, but this is all part of the diplomatic effort. These statements matter. They are being read. They are being analyzed in Moscow, and they try to divide the allies. And I'm afraid that you know that you put a stress that the new chancellor and new government then they are behaving honorable now. I get it, but we don't have time. And who is going to pay the price? Ukraine, of course, and European Union. Too. So, Nora, the the um, the question that uh, Eugenia is just um, raising, the appearance of equidistance, the the uh, the both sides types rhetoric. How do you what do you make of this? Do you see this in the German public? Do you see a change in 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 that, given the blatant uh, threat uh, that we're seeing? I might mention the, the remarkable speech of the German federal president for his second inaugural 48 hours ago, in which he, harking back to uh, Ronald Reagan's Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, said Mr. Putin, uh, loosen the noose. So, um, so, so what do you make of, 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 of that phenomenon of the German debate? Well, I, I carefully listened to what Eugenius was was saying, and I think some of the points you raised are are very um, very important. Um, as I said earlier on, I, I'm not claiming that no mistakes were made by the by the government in handling the current crisis, and the howitzer issue, of course, is an infamous one and and was very hard to to comprehend. Um, but when it comes to the issue of, of unity and determination um, and showing strength vis-a-vis -vis Russia, I think we should also pay attention to the fact that um, prior to Chancellor Scholz's visit to, um, to uh, Moscow, he was not only in Ukraine, did go to, to Maidan, but um, he also hosted the three um, Baltic heads of state here in, in, in Berlin, which I think was an important, important signal, not only of, of solidarity, but also reassurance and um, Berlin um, is sending uh, additional troops to Lithuania to um, reinforce um, the the um, enhanced forward present battle groups there, which is which is um, led by by Germany. Um, obviously, I mean there are different voices in Germany as well, both in the political spectrum and also in, in, in public opinion. But I think what matters is um, what the kind of line that the government takes and not what, you know, some, some sort of um, gas from lobbyists or, or others have to say, because they're not the ones to determine um, Germany's government position. The Gazprom lobbyist is is the acronym for a German, for my German chancellor. Okay, so maybe to all of you, um, uh, one question is from the chat here: Is why isn't the U.S. Why isn't Europe adopting strategic ambiguity a la Taiwan um, as a strategy and thereby re reassuring uh, Putin that Ukraine will be effectively fin Finlandized? It's a, one of the the topics often discussed uh, these days. Because that rewards Russian military intimidation of neighbors that pose no threat to them. 
<laughs> full stop. <laughs> full stop. Laura, full stop? Not much to add to that, I guess. Okay. Sometimes the shortest answers are uh, uh, the best. In quite the opposite, in a, a, a different direction. Let me, let me just say, though, that the short answer isn't a disrespect to the question. I think it's an important question, but also one that we should answer with clarity. No, I, I didn't mean to suggest that, Corey. I mean, it's quite serious that, about your response here. Um, um, one of the questions, a question from Paris here. What about Macron? Um, what is, uh, so the, how is the French, um, how is the French uh, attempt being viewed by, the, by this panel here? Um, there is the there is a convergence in in, in thinking between uh, Scholz and uh, and uh, and and Macron in some in, in some respects. How do you evaluate that? And by the way, that's probably a question that also goes uh, to the perspective to a perspective from Central and Eastern Europe. Well, I believe that uh, Macron's effort uh, has been very credible. First of all, he really this time, and I will stress this time, paid much attention to consulting the allies, talking to Berlin, talking to Washington, talking to Poland, uh, Weimar Triangle meeting for the first time in nine years at the presidential level. And so he went to Moscow, not like it happened before with the French presidents as a solo uh, performer, but having the backing of, uh, of, of, all, of all concerns. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that it was a positive effort. And uh, the fact that following his return from Moscow, he actually has been putting on the table, which was reported by one of the German newspapers, that the deterrence needs to be strengthened uh, on the Eastern flank, shows that, he, I mean, the reality uh, hit him. And the language used during the meeting, nine meters long table meeting with, with Putin, was for all to see. And the fact how he was treated at the airport when a car was not provided um, to, to get him to the, to the plane, the symbolism uh, is important and he understood it. So he must have said during the meeting something which made Kremlin a bit unhappy. Uh, so I am, I am, I am rather positive about, uh, about Macron's efforts. You know, the, 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 the problem which we discuss here is that we have the rich rhetoric of unity and we cannot allow ourselves to show that we actually, there are actually major divisions and, and, and the paralysis that emerges because that destroys the, the purpose of the diplomatic effort and augments the threat to, the Euro to, to Ukraine's security. Also, I want to point out something. Some people, when I raise this argument, they say, well, but we have NATO. Of course, NATO is different, the United States is there, et cetera, et cetera. But I point out that somehow many people forget that the same governments are in NATO. And it, it, enough, it is enough for one to veto, and NATO cannot act. This is an important aspect of this, of this whole charade, you know, unity, language, events, negotiations, unity, event, this is the way how to proceed. And I, I, I don't see it in, in the context of German government, I'm sorry to say. A couple of questions. Again, we're, we're, since this is an evolving situation, I'm, most of the questions are about the current events situation rather than about the German perspective. And I would like to accept that given the nature of evolving events as we, as we have this panel. One question is, does the Schultz visit have anything to do with what we're seeing on the ground? Is that an effect of him or does any of what he's doing there have have anything to do with with the apparent with the apparent first elements of a withdrawal um, 
of, uh, of, of Russian troops. And a second question, and I'll ask, uh, put that to the, span, uh, to the panel. What about the, um, and I'll, I'll read this, what do the speakers think about the reiterated and unusual appeals by all representatives of the Biden administration that Russia is about to invade? In other words, exaggerated question mark, any strategy behind that, any way we can interpret this? I think there is a strategy behind it, which is not to allow Russian disinformation or false flag operations where they make outrageous claims that then try and position themselves to justify an invasion of Ukraine. I think the Biden administration has done a terrific job of trying to get out ahead of that kind of gray zone warfare. Um, I also think it has helped um, hold the alliance together by not allowing the Russians to say different things to different allies. So I think it's a good thing that they've done it. Um, yes, I mean, you can see the friction between the Biden administration, which is trying to prevent Russia from being able to effectively use disinformation and the frustration of the Zelensky administration in Ukraine, which is trying to keep their economy from collapsing or a refugee flow from starting. And those are both legitimate interests and they're in tension with each other. But I do think both governments are doing the right thing, the things that they should be doing at this moment. Nora, um, any uh, Schultz have anything to do with current events or is this a uh, coincidence? No, I, I don't think it's a coincidence, but I will say that first of all, we'll, we'll have to wait and see whether those sort of de-escalatory measures that were announced by the Russian side will sort of um, will, will be implemented also on, on the ground. This is one. And then second of all, um, if, if we do see um, de-escalation, then I think it has a lot to do with um, sort of the, the deterrent that, um, that um, NATO and, 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 and the Europeans um, kind of have, have, have built up. And when I say deterrence, um, I don't only mean that in, in, in military terms, but also when it comes to the economic measures that were put explicitly or implicitly on the table um, to raise the cost for um, a potential invasion on, on the part of Russia. So uh, my, my message here is that, you know, this kind of pressure I think has worked if it is really the case that um, a, a, a sort of a process of, of serious de-escalation is underway. So cumulative pressure seems to have worked. So here's a question exactly in that, in that direction for you, Eugenia. Uh, and I'll read this to you. Do you. Don't you think that Putin overestimated the effects of his threatening an invasion as a way of getting concessions from the US, NATO, et cetera? Question mark. I, I think he did. I think he did. I, I think he really has counted on this unity of the Western allies with all the weaknesses we have we have talked about but i do not think that uh, the threat uh, has passed uh you know uh, the experts look at two aspects of the situation one is of course more global that means to neutralize ukraine to become for ukraine to become part of the ruski mir that means the russian word uh, you know fernanda side if you want the other is a problem, a major problem of Crimea. Crimea has no water. Water did come from, by the so-called North Korean canal from the Ukraine, which Ukraine have closed down in 2015 as a result of the annexation of Crimea. And there, there, there was a lot of signs that the military operation can take place at this piece of land. That means to get water into Crimea because otherwise it is very difficult to sustain agriculture in, uh, in, in, in Crimea. 
So uh, I don't think that threat has passed and it will very much depend on a diplomatic effort. But diplomatic effort is very, it's needed, it's unavoidable, but it's also very dangerous to Ukraine because the, the Ukraine will be the a side that will pay the price. That's what I fear. Question for Nora, and I'll read it. And let me also mention that we're about three minutes from the end of this, so I will have uh, combined this with any final thoughts that you might have. Uh, Germany's reluctance to sacrifice Nord Stream 2 is understandable, whether or not one agrees with it. But what do you make of Germany's refusal to allow weapons and other materials with, Ger uh, with German exports and IP content to be exported to Ukraine by Denmark and other countries? Don't know about this latest. That was news to me, but maybe you know more about this and you find yourself able to answer that one. Well, what I will try to do is um, a sort of explain the German stance when it comes to um, the issue of, of weapons delivery to, to Ukraine. And um, this is an ongoing debate in, in Berlin, frankly speaking, and there are some voices that actually um, do um, speak out in favor of um, changing the, the, the well-known German um, policy of not um, supplying arms um, into so-called areas of, of, of crises. Mm, I think um, I, I, I think I, kind of with with NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg here, who, who was at the Kerber Foundation not long ago, and what he said on that issue is it's okay in an alliance like NATO to have a division of labor, namely um, having some allies who, who provide um, uh, arms um, to to a country like Ukraine to sort of um, support its, um, its its defensive structures, and to have other allies like Germany. Um, who take economic measures to build up a credible deterrent. So in that sense, I think um, uh, that that argument is definitely valid. Plus, there is an additional argument for Germany not delivering arms to Ukraine, and that is not sort of jeopardizing its um, channels of communication vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. And I think that's that's a valid argument as well. Um, that uh, partly answered the question, I guess. It did, but let me just mention that France is one of the bigger weapons suppliers. It's also in the Normandy format. And also it also has that same position vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. Uh, but I'll put that in parentheses. I'm supposed to be a, uh, a, a moderator here, Corey. Um, what's a le realistic prospect for Russian de-escalation? How would you sort of map for me next steps that you would wish to see or how you would evaluate next steps that you could, that we might, we might see after these, these, these overture that we've seen today? So it would be a really wonderful thing if Vladimir Putin would uh, accept uh, the suggestion by the German Chancellor that Ukraine's not going to be ready for NATO membership anytime soon as success, de-escalate, remove troops from Ukraine's border um, and allow uh, the government of Ukraine to continue working to be deserving of NATO membership and to corruption, considered consolid continued consolidation of democracy, all of the important standards that uh, NATO members met in previous rounds of expansion uh, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, I'm skeptical Russia was plans to do that though. It looks to me like what they wanna do is keep military pressure on Ukraine to keep them uh, anxious and to do enormous damage to the Ukrainian economy because Russia under Vladimir Putin, its measure of success is keeping the countries it can unstable, unsafe, and poor. And Mr. Putin in the press conference already rejected uh, the idea uh, that Mr. Scholz put forward and said that's not enough in so many other words. Now, final question to you, Eugenius, with the, since we're already a minute over, 
to, uh, to be a little short on a big question. Is the NATO-Russia founding act, de-escalation or no de-escalation, dead, as was suggested in the Weimar meeting between President, President Duda, uh, Macron and Chancellor Scholz a couple of days ago? Yeah, I think it's dead. It, it is dead because of uh, changed circumstances. The funding act says that nothing will, uh, there will not be any major changes in terms of security. That means the major um, uh, stationing of troops, no nukes, you know, all this, all those things. But Russia has changed its posture. Russia has yeah, changed let me policy. Inter let me interrupt you. Uh, how are you going to get, if you, if you de declare it dead now, how does that contribute to, uh, to de-escalating the situation? Well, it probably it doesn't, but you know the escalation of the situation depends uh, not on uh, symbolism, but of what actually Russia will be ready to do. I mean, the, the, you know, diplomacy can go that far. Diplomacy has to be backed by other uh, way of expressing your policies. So this is the funding act is a sim sim symbol. Of, of, a, of a bygone era as a Germany Ostpolitik is. The situation has changed so tremendously in so many ways, but we still, in the German debate, we hear about the Ostpolitik, etc. It has to become a European Ostpolitik, not a German Ostpolitik, in order to be effective. Eugenia, that was a good final word, I think, a European Ostpolitik rather than a German Ostpolitik. I want to thank the panel for being uh, with us on this uh, on this special day uh, and want to thank uh, our group of more than a uh, hundred participants of which numerous have asked questions and that I regret not having been able to take all of them but have tried to group them uh, as best I could so thank you all have a good evening thank you thank you